Oh yeah, it's recording. recording. Cool. Okay, um, Paul, do you want to have a um, Oh, say something? Uh, so this is, um, this is controversial topics in animal rights. We did this a couple of years ago, but the uh, change this time is that Paul Valley and Victoria Lyon are going to be co-presenting, and we're going to cover a number of topics, um, all of which are controversial and animal rights activists argue over. So these are not controversial topics with uh, meat eaters, but amongst ourselves. And some of the issues are, frankly, they're irresolvable. Um, you might have a very strong opinion on one side or the other, but I think the point of having the discussion is to present the idea that they are issues that can be um, openly discussed and that we don't have to necessarily always take a very strong ideological position on, but they're open to debate, they're open to, uh, and I think that's important. That's, the, that's actually the foundation of philosophy, is to say that everything is open for debate. Now, you can come out on one side of the debate or the other, but it's first important to have that debate, and so that's what this is about. So we'll have a format where there will be 40 uh, minutes per speaker, each and, uh, and, and, well, sorry, 40 minutes, 20 minutes per speech, and then 40, 20 minutes for discussion for what Paul is presenting for Victoria uh, 2020, and then for myself 2020. So there'll be, the discussions will be broken into three parts. So we'll start now. Thank you for starting. Um, th thanks to Paul for, uh, I don't know, some of you know Paul is, is leaving us. He's, he's going south. Oh, he's enough. For, to at least at least finishing his thesis, we'll see how long he stays down there. But uh, Paul, uh, Animal Rights Academy is really Paul York's great child. I know many of you know, and um, he sort of passed the torch on to Victoria uh, Lyon, who's, who's who will be here shortly. And yourself. And and, and myself, I'll, I'll be like the faculty advisor. And I should note also that Ian Purdy, who's sitting here, started it with me. Oh, Ian, yeah. Ian, and and Paul yeah, yeah. together. So um, um, uh, sorry, Ian, I hadn't realized you were you were there. Um, <laughs> I knew you were uh, part of the genesis of the whole thing. But, uh, you know, Ian Purdy and, and Paul York um, have put this all together, and it's been running. Uh, this is the third year running. I think so. So, um, anyway, welcome, welcome. Um, uh, so, I, you know, Paul had suggested maybe we each pick a couple of topics. Um, uh, when I, I I was looking into my potentials, I, I realized the one I had, I could talk about for twenty minutes, and I'm sure we could talk about afterwards for twenty minutes. So, I, I'm just going to cover one. Um, topic, and this is um, the question of, okay, if you're on board for changing the world to make it more animal friendly, um, the question then becomes uh, not just the practical one, but the, uh, you know, there's a, there's a philosophical, ethical issue there about uh, uh, what, what tactics to use, and uh, one way, not the only way, but one way of dividing the field of tactics is into violent and non. And, you know, the more philosophical we get today, the more um, we'll elide that distinction. We'll ask the, the typical definitional question of a philosopher, which is, what is violence anyway? Aren't words themselves a kind of violence? Um, and so, the, you know, we'll, we'll, part of the, part of the uh, mandate today might be to blur the distinction a little bit between violent and non. But just, you know, before we get into that, note, of course, that that's just, as I said, one way of dividing up the field of tactics. Um, you could also divide them into legal and non. And the two don't always map on to each other, not all. Non-violent things are legal and... Uh, oh. So in favor of... In favor of violence, we could start with the uh, self-defense defense. And if we can show that the position of, of non-human animals right now is analogous to a victim of an ongoing uh, perpetration of violence. And if you accept that in situations like that, um, an agent has permission or even an obligation to mitigate or stop that violence in progress. It might be an obligation. It might be that it's not just like you can use violence if you want to. It might be that by the dictates of morality, it's demanded that you do whatever it takes to stop the home invader from killing your children. Take the horrific, um, prototypical 
example, a home invader for whatever, you know, unjustified homicide, they're seeking to kill you and your family, most people, most people, and I suspect you'd have some instant on-site on conversions for people who in the abstract wouldn't in that situation would be converted pretty quickly to violent response, whatever it takes response to stop the perpetrator from the crime in progress. So here we have, a, you know, Victoria Nash, you know, the sort of crime in progress lady in distress to ne'er-do-wells um, in the early stages of attacking her. And uh, most of us think of this sort of situation as one in which um, violence is justified, it's justified anywhere. And the question we need to ask is whether the, the animal situation is analogous to the situation on the left. So we have a dairy cow here awaiting what horrors this could be on the kill floor. This could be at the factory farm. But you know nice things aren't happening to her and hers. I, I would argue that, in fact, um, our relationship with, with the animals, certainly the ones we've co-opted for agriculture, the word agriculture itself is a euphemism, I think, hiding violence, and, and the animals we've co-opted and enslaved for our use, for meat and for... Um, this is war against the animals that's been won so decisively it doesn't look like war anymore. Right? So if, you know, we wind the clock to, I hate to always do the slavery comparison, but it's apt often and uh, sticks. Um, you know, think of 1790, if you, if you just casually gaze at the state of the slave republic, it wouldn't be apparent to you necessarily that this was a terrible thing. I mean, if you've got, if you, I mean, um, what, what, what is the outcome of a war between cultures and violent enslavement and chaining and whipping can end up, when the victory is complete, looking like something very different, right? The slaves are no longer always in chains, they're usually in chains. They're whistling while they work. They're happy sometimes. And so it's easy to look at that and say, well, this is not war anymore. This is something else. This is just the nature. So when war is won very decisively and a populace is enslaved with a kind of totality, um, they, they can internalize a lot of the mechanisms of oppression and participate in their own oppression. So the happy, there are happy cows in the field grazing. But we can't forget that um, that situation is the outcome of very brutal enslavement of herd animals, which involved maybe 8,000 years ago, first of all, killing off most of the males and castrating the remainder, leaving a few for breeding, and penning them in, and taking complete control individually of their sexual lives, taking genetic control of the destiny of the species, metasexual control of the animal, and completely manipulating and distorting with, with, with long-term violence form of these animals. I mean, you, I mean, one of the tragedies of even farm sanctuaries now is they get these rescue animals and the animals are miserable even on the farm sanctuaries because of their species condition. They're, you know, they're meant to be slaughtered at eight months, not to live eight or 18 years. The frame can't hold up all that meat we've loaded onto them. So, you know, it's, it's slower motion in some cases, though it's, you know, what maybe is about to happen to her is, is very similar in terms of time lapse to what could happen here. There is a... There is a... Um, I think, I th I think uh, enough of an analogy. There's, I think there are enough analogies between the two situations for us to say that if violent, corrective, self-defensive action is warranted in the case on the left, then it's warranted in the case on the right. So if you don't think so, if you think that obviously in this case one should, you know, shame on you who doesn't, one should intervene, why do you say not so for, for this case? Just think, think about that. Now, Um, so if we think of the, the Gandhian, I didn't go back and read, you know, my experiments with truth or, um, you know, I, 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 Gandhian, I'll say, I don't know if this is um, 
orthodox Gandhi. But what you could call the Gandhian position, Paul might be able to, in the discussion, uh, take us through the finer points of the orthodox Gandhian position. But, but you know, what's, what's kind of be called a kind of Gandhian approach in terms of tactics is to, uh, to say there must be some harmony between means and ends. So the, what's the end state we're trying to achieve? Well, something like the peaceful kingdom of Isaiah, right? Where, where there's harmony, nonviolent harmony within the animal kingdom, at least in our relationship with them. And um, uh, if, if to get to that, we've done massive violence, and it's going to take massive violence for using a violent approach to overturn the current relationship with humans and if we've achieved it through violence, well, what's wrong with the final picture then? It's been sullied, right? It's like by its genesis, it itself had, there's something rotten now in the, in the garden. Or in the, in the, in the, in the peaceful you know, you can't actually achieve it through violence. That's the... So there's a practical question, too, of, of whether it, it can even be achieved. That is, um, if the agents who are the architects of this new remade peaceful world are themselves, and think of what it takes to commit yourself to a life it's going to be a lifetime at least to work this through. If you've gotten yourself into that mind state, I mean, you're going to have a, you're going to have a peaceful kingdom or a, a, a final Eden filled with PTSD and um, you know shell shocked and hair trigger violent individuals. So that's that's one way of thinking about Gandhian critique of violent tactics. Um, so, uh, there's something very powerful, and this is maybe getting towards more just pragmatic considerations. So, notice how important the distinction is between in principle and in practice, that, that one might agree in principle to violent tactics, but say in, in practice, what will be more effective are nonviolent techniques. And, uh, you know, surely Gandhi saw the, in terms of media spectacle, he's thinking like a modern media um, sort of master. Um, when he saw that it will look very bad for empire to be using its billy sticks on the you know, peacefully approaching lines of Indians, uh, turning the other cheek, right? appealing to the Christian roots of this empire. Um, so in terms of tactics, it may be more practical to, to embrace the non-violent. Um, it also might, in terms of the psychology, like, like what Anita tries to do with these vigils at the slaughterhouses, is, uh, which, which is based on this Tolstoyan, Approach is to create kind of this circle, this little aisle of peace within this very violent site of the slaughterhouses. And this is more powerful than yelling at the drivers coming in the trucks or yelling at the workers as they're you know, coming up for their lunch break or smoke break and throwing rocks at the windows that whatever your intention in doing that, your intention in doing that is to save the animals, their intention and their violent acts is to hurt the animals. Um, whatever the intention, there's something qualitatively similar, and then in principle similar, though, to forms of violence. Right? The, um, so the most powerful, pra pragmatically the most powerful uh, technique is to create peace. And that takes courage, right? I mean, it takes... Um, to insert yourself in a site of violence is to put yourself at risk. The question is whether you're going to enact violence there yourself or uh, create something, some, something different at that site. This, is, uh, this thought just kind of came to me. I haven't really thought it through too much, but I, I don't know if it holds up to, to philosophical scrutiny, but another reason in favor of nonviolent tactics. And, and this might be more compelling, especially in the early generations of um, the animal movement, like right now, that most of us are not AR from birth. We weren't steeped in an AR environment. We came to it at some point. As you get to know people in the Toronto movement, anyway, you find them often very recently. Like most of the people I meet who come to the vigils and come out here, you ask them, so when did you, when did the light go on? When, like last February, or 2011, or they weren't raised in a vegan environment by hippie parents, you know? So like, um, I mean, it's a dramatic switch. It really is like taking the red pill and 
see what's going on. And then, and then when you see what's going on, maybe you feel anything is then justified. It doesn't matter that a year ago I was one of the people who were perpetuating this, this system. Now I see what's going on. Now there's a very different obligation on me to change it. Well, you might step back from that a little bit and say, but, you know, I was changed through nonviolent means. No one, no one threw rocks at me or yelled at me necessarily. And you've got to give many other people that, that chance. You've got to be gentle with people who are really like you in, in their trajectory. And we're so entwined with the system. Everybody has a father or a sister or an ex or a child who isn't on side. And so if, if you take the violent approach, it really will be like that. You know, war that will divide every family. So you might think, well, at least for now, pass it on. Now, as the movement gains generational kind of um, sustenance, and you get more and more people raised in that environment, you might find a bit more of a division in society along this, this question. It won't be the only question, but along this question, you might find generational, like, like two cultures arising, right? They're sustained over generations, and then... For, for people um, who've multi-generationally been steeped in kind of an AR ethic, this won't seem quite as compelling. There really will be a sense of us versus them, and they deserve, they've had enough time now too, right? They've had enough time. They've received a pamphlet a thousand times. They've seen the Mercy for Animals investigation a thousand times. They know what's going on, and they still haven't changed. I changed, you know, yes, I was once like them maybe, or my grandfather was once like them, but they saw the Mercy for Animals investigation, they saw the statistics, and they changed within a year. And there are just these intransigent people who will not change, and now we have to talk about violent tactics to change it. So that, so again, this could wane as a compelling reason with some time. And then, you know, we can ask what violence really is. Um, it really does fall apart a little. I mean, we have, you know, clear, Examples which we'd all agree are violence, but that, you know, pointing at something is not a definition. It's not like like the judge infamously said about pornography when he failed to give a good definition of it at the censorship trial. He said, "Well, I know it when I see it." <laughs> well, some violence we know when we see, but violence, could you say it's like force forcibly changing someone, even if that change is breaking a limb, but. When you change someone's mind, you're changing their behavior. You're taking control of their body, their future movements. For example, if you change their mind, um, if they loved Tim Hortons, and then you tell them something about Tim Hortons, and it changes their mind, and they never go to Tim Hortons again, you've made physical changes to their behavior. Their legs are going different ways now when they come to the crossroads, at one end of which is a Tim Hortons, and the other end of which is a what have you. So even, even beliefs forcibly change people. Well, you may say, well, that's through reasoning, but reasons can compel, right? We're rational enough that if you hear the reason in the right context, it's going to compel your mind to change and then compel your behavior to change. So, uh, words can be physically, physically coercive. Words change behavior. And so you're physically coercing someone sometimes with words. And also, acts can be words. Acts are communication. So, um, um, beating someone up sends a message. Um, burning down a slaughterhouse is, a, is an act of communication. It's not just that, it's also de destroying some physical property. And, but, it, but it's also, there's, there's a semantic element to any act, and, and especially, you know, the more Ritualized, the act becomes, the more it's timed and framed as a communication, whether they're press releases or not, the more the act of destruction becomes a communication also. Right? I mean, when the November 6th action, um, oh, we at 20 minutes almost? Well, you have about six minutes left for the religion. For the religion. Oh, no, I'm just doing this one. Oh, you're just doing Yeah, okay. Um, um, 
Oh, November sixth. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, we sent out a press release on the November sixth. We, we blocked some trucks at the slaughterhouse, and um, um, we sent out a press release, you know, to be clear to the media what, what our intention was. But well, we didn't need to, strictly speaking. Strictly speaking, the city having a few people sit in front of the trucks blocking the drive at the slaughterhouse that itself was a communication. It was saying something. No, it wasn't a violent communication. It was physically coercive. It was saying, no, you can't pass. I mean, we moved out of the way eventually. We were pulled out of the way. But, so was the sit-in violent? Well, it had an element of physical coercion. And where's the line between violent physical coercion and non-violent physical coercion? So, you know, blurring the boundaries a little bit helps to open up the way for both parties to find some common ground, to realize that maybe, maybe what you liked about the violent tactics have some version in the non-violent forms of communication and, and vice versa. So this is, this is an act. This is, this is uh, well, it went under a, the banner of ALF, as these acts often do. And this was in 1997, Jonathan Paul in Oregon. There was this horse slaughterhouse, which people could hear the screams coming from constantly. I don't think the locals were big fans of it. Probably were glad Jonathan Paul did this. He, he burned the place down and put it out of business permanently for whatever reason um, the owners gave for that. Um, so this now now the question here is is, is this violence? Is this violence? It's potential violence, of course. Um, um, I promised someone to never burn anything down because, uh, as she said, when you start a fire, you don't know where it ends. So you, you know, when you, when, you, when you start a fire, you're already giving something over to something that, out of anyone's control. Um, but uh, is, is, so is destruction, massive destruction to property, is that, is that in the violent side of things? It's a very effective communication. How? Well, instead of, I mean, it says, it says this is, this is serious, right? I often feel that we really do think that killing animals for food is a form of murder. I think, I think a lot of people don't take it seriously when we say that, because all we do is like hold a banner up or hand out some pamphlets on the street and say, thank you for taking one. And understandably, their reaction mentally might be, well, you're saying it's murder, but this is all you're doing in response to it. That's not the way someone reacts to it. So uh, I think, as, as, as you said once, Paul, that there's a lot of speciesism in the animal, which is the way you'd react if someone was doing this to a member of your family is not at all the way you're reacting when someone's doing it to beings you cl claim you brought into your circle of compassion, if not your family. So they are your extended mammal and bird and fish family. So, um, you know, an act like this is a very powerful communication in that it says, because there's some danger in it, I think, and because it actually stops what was going on there. Now you might say, well, in most cases, they'll just get the insurance money and they'll rebuild the slaughterhouse with, you know, like, to make it even more efficient and kill more horses. Or all those horses are going to be slaughtered anyway. It's not like people who are going to send them here are going to say, oh, well, I guess we'll just put them at the pasture now or, or give them, donate them to the farm sanctuary. They're going to send them to another slaughterhouse. Um, well, yeah, but, you know, no tactic is effective if only one person does it. Everyone can do this. You know, how many vegans are in, are in Toronto alone? <sighs> Several billion, you've got 100,000 there. If every vegan burnt a slaughterhouse down once in their life, you know, you kind of put the whole industry, if not out of business, it would be in a situation where they'd have to have like armed security guards running along with the trucks and like, I mean, it would, it would change the nature of the industry radically. And in a way, the industry would have to start showing show its true violent face. Um, so maybe this isn't individual, this is what one person did. You might, you might say, in terms of pragmatics, what does it really accomplish? What it at least accomplishes as much as handing out a pamphlet, and that's an act of communication. And then practically, if more people did it, it's like the November 6th action. I think a lot of people said, well, what's it going to do? The police are going to pull you away, and the truck will go in anyway, and you didn't really save any cows, and just got people angry. And Yeah, well, if everyone had done it, we could have shut down every slaughterhouse in North America that day. So... Uh, yeah. I'm just 
going to lead off and say, uh, first, thank you. That's very passionate. Uh, the, um, I'll, I expect by next week uh, we'll start getting, uh, if this actually goes out on YouTube, we'll start getting people from CSIS attending our lectures. <laughs> <laughs> Is this notice <laughs> a little bit? Uh, I think you um, you erred a little bit on the pro violence side. In the, in it, but well, I think so many of us, like uh, obviously most of us, aren't doing violence. So, like, yeah. if anyone needs the argument in their favor in this context, it's, it's that side. Most of us aren't engaged in ALF style activities. Yeah. So, I'm arguing for that absent person in the room who will be that. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, few, a couple of things there that um, I probably have to disagree with. Uh, first of all, a thought or a word as coercive, well, they can be, yes, but if, if the word or the thought is helping the person to make an autonomous moral decision upon their own, it's not necessarily coercive. It's, um, I wouldn't say that thoughts and words are not violent, and that uh, although they could lead somebody to violence of their own volition, but they can be differentiated strongly from actions which cause physical harm or, say, psychological abuse or something like that. That's a very, there's, well, okay, their thoughts and words can cause psychological abuse, but I mean, telling somebody to, uh, that they shouldn't be doing something is very different from physically stopping them from doing it. Um, I also would differentiate um, the burning of the slaughterhouse in November 6, because the uh, while it's true that if everybody did it, society would transform, would change, uh, it would absolutely. Uh, the, 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 va the, the value of the nonviolent action of November 6 is that it, uh, it, it created a sort of a, a moral space in which we could say, we had the moral high ground, we could say this is wrong, and we're not engaging in the same degree of violence that you are, we're better than that, and you can be too. So it's transformative to the, for the oppressor, which is a principle of Gandhianism. Um, and, um, but burning down the slaughterhouse would be viewed by the mainstream society and by the law enforcement as an act of terrorism, and they would see it, they would respond defensively and aggressively and demonize animal rights activists as extremists, which they have done. Um, so, in a sense, the, it's a, there's a practical argument for that you did refer to earlier, um, of where it's, it's, it's pragmatic to uh, take the nonviolent action because of how society sees it. They see burning the slaughterhouse down. Uh, it's a symbolic act. They see it as an act of terrorism, as an act of violence. They don't see what we did necessarily in the same way. Uh, they see the police acting against us, and then that the police are looked at, and that's precisely why the police tried to turn it on its head, because for, for they, they wanted to make us appear violent, and then they, that, that fact, themselves were violent. So, um, now the, the, the one argument that you didn't include for violence, which you could have, and has been done many, many times, is, well, the argument, what about World War II? Gandhi was, is a, uh, many people will say, uh, you know, Gandhianism works in the British context of British um, in empire because the British are essentially a good, a moral people, um, whereas it wouldn't work, say, against somebody like Hitler. And then we can say that the slaughterhouses are much closer to Auschwitz than, you know, empire. Well, the whole invasion uh, example yeah. was meant to be yeah, standing yeah, for that. Yeah. Kind of but, but, I, I, but I would say that there, uh, we often underestimate the power of nonviolence and. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, you know, wrote a foreword to a book in the 60s, uh, I forget the title, but it went through, one of the chapters went through all the acts of nonviolence that occurred in World War II and how they were uh, in, in countries and areas where they were practiced more, there was, the, the Nazis had less of a foothold. So the, and violence occurs where people let uh, fascism in, in a sense, and where they don't, it has less of a foothold, and so nonviolent tactics can be effective even in war time, I'll try to argue. So I think there, yeah. I think you want to, if I'm advocating for anything here, it's that the, the nonviolent style is not, is not, from what I've observed in, in, in the local scene, it's not radical at all. Like, 
It's not interventionist enough to even do that. Uh, we can do a lot. We can, within the realm of nonviolence, do a lot more and put ourselves a lot more at risk, like trespassing a lot more, not not obeying the rules, like not being so well behaved, right? So I agree with that. Um, so nonviolent non-cooperation. Like the number six radical. was a nice balance, yeah. maybe for me. I mean, it's like it's like more of that. That shouldn't be like a once a year thing. It should be like I mean, the vigils are. Core. I mean, what Anita has started as the vigils has made so much as possible. I feel, but and I think Anita also wants people to go forward with that a little bit and and use that as a springboard into what I mean. Why aren't hands linked around these slaughterhouses every day? At least once a week. Why aren't more people getting arrested? What? So the argument is not against nonviolence. The argument is against um, weak tactics. Might be, yeah, yeah. It's like so it's, that's, it's, that's, um, a, that's a different argument. A little bit more of yeah. putting our bodies in the line, right? Like putting our bodies between the animals and the machine, and putting ourselves our bodies at risk. So that's we're, we're walking a little bit more into the uh, realm of where the violence is. It's almost like we're very afraid of the sight of violence. There's a lot of horror attached to these sites, and we stay a little bit clear of it too. Think of the vigils as being the early stage of a uh, of a siege, you know, to advance in a little bit too, and, and and that will bring violence upon us, right? Like walking towards the building close a little bit more, and then people will. It's like then people will understand the communication to the obtuse public. People will start to take us and the movement a bit more seriously. Um, oh, they really are mad about this. <laughs> Oh, they really, they really do mean it's bloody murder. They really, you know, it's... I don't, I don't think necessarily right now our tactics are always in line with that. If you really are outraged that someone's murdering a loved one, I don't know if you hand up pamphlets and ask people to go vegan. Well, it's transformative. And um, that, that, that vegan outreach, that's the idea is that it's treating the other human being as though they can make more decisions. No, you, just, you, don't, you don't just do that. No, that's, like, I'm all for, like, multi-pronged um, uh, tactics, so I'm in favor of both. I think each has its place. I just think we can't too much be doing the pamphleting and the asking nicely. That has to be balanced with stuff a little bit more like the November 6th action. That's, that's, that's my view. I'm not ready to go into violence myself. So you're for yet. militancy, but it doesn't have to be violent militancy if you're non-violent militancy. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's... Trying to stop it. No, I'm like, is, is it violent to like to grab someone's hand and bring a knife down? Like, is that violence? Not to hit them in the head, but to say stop. Is that violence? That's self, that's truly self defensive. Defensive um, or other defensive, right? Yeah. You're saying, well, there isn't a, this idea of just war is the same principle, yeah. but um, I mean, how many of us would, would truly, if someone was bringing the knife upon us, just let it happen? How many? How, all of us would put our hands up to stop it. So the question is, why we don't do that when the knife is coming down on other beings? I what's, think what's the moral the, the, the answer to this is that uh, is that the violent nonviolence approach is predicated on the idea that society can transform and that it and that it, with enough effort that it will. Um, and the nonviolent position is predicated on the idea that society won't, and therefore these other tactics are necessary. No, it's not, it's not predicated on, on the view that they won't. It's predicated, maybe it's sometimes predicated just on the view that this is a moral emergency, and whatever the future plan is, this has, this has to stop right now. So it's like, um, you know, within the home invasion case, I'm not thinking, well, okay, they got me, but someone will talk to them and slowly change their mind, and the home invasion will stop. I'm, I'm like, this is a moral emergency, and I have to stop them right now. I'm not worried about a long-term strategy for the anti-home invasion movement, right? I'm stopping them because what they're... And, and so why isn't that logic applied to the animal case? Like, what prevents the transfer of logic there? Well, obviously, the means and the ends are, have to be the same thing. And the means are... The, not only are they have to be the same thing, he said they are the same thing. The means, as the means, so the ends. So if you use violence means you are, in a sense, he was saying, uh, you're, you're setting up the conditions for a violent end. Anyway. It's the fear. Is everyone's afraid of, you know, doing those big actions, you know, they're afraid they do those big actions and not be able to do a little actions anymore. Because I think that's what comes down to it, is a lot of it is just being excluded from society, you know, you, you do the, the standing in the grocery store and tell everyone what they're doing wrong, and then everyone in society just kind of pushes you aside, except for the vegans, right? But there just aren't, maybe 
a practical consideration too, Katie. I mean, it's like um, if they nab you for the big one, then you're out of commission for five years. Maybe like like so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, if you've got a hundred thousand people who are committed, like enough is enough. We're ready now. Like yeah. I don't care if I can't cross the border anymore. I don't care if I end up in jail for this. There are a hundred thousand people in line behind me who will take my place. Right, walking yeah. up in line at the billy clubs. When it gets to that situation, yeah, then practically we um, all feel that way. Yeah. We don't have hundred thousand people behind right. us. We have three hundred that do the march to close down the slaughterhouse yeah. in Toronto. And it's, it's the numbers like that that depress me sometimes and make me think people aren't changing. They don't, they're not listening. And you know, it can be very frustrating when you, when, yeah. you, when you read like statistics like, oh, how many Americans are vegan? Oh, well, 8% of American Whole Foods customers are vegetarian. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. It's always like way, way worse than anything. <laughs> and what, what info have they not received yet? video have they not seen? What are they not aware of? So at a certain point, you have a right to say, enough. Yeah. At a certain point, you have a right to... Line. There's definitely a line that people have to cross. There's just people that are they're just happy to be vegan, you know, doing their own thing, but there's something that switch that goes off in the activist's mind. Yeah. You need to get those switches on everybody. Oh, yeah. yeah it, does, it does go off. Yeah. And sh shame is good, too. Like, the more, the more you um, take these beans into your circle of care, the more shameful you can feel Pushing those beans around, and you're not doing anything about them. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, some of the population, population votes nowadays. Like, I mean, if the vegans actually all voted, maybe we'd be able to change some policies, but only what 30% of the population is actually voting. It's those same 30% that's running the world. Uh, I, th I think one of the pragmatic arguments here for the non violent approach is that we'll never get beyond. Um, you know, the, the numbers that we have now, if we engage in tactics that um, marginalize this within society, mainstream society, we have to use mainstream tactics to get um, to do real law, so, social, legal, and political reform. There is that pragmatic argument. But there's also a philosophical argument, which is that, you know, you had the phrase break the cycle of violence. I believe in that um, idea, which is that if you read Animal Farm by Orwell, those who take over end up being just as violent as those that you served in revolutions. It doesn't and have to be that way. I don't think there's a, there's a Well, revolutionaries always assume logic. they'll be better, and not, it doesn't always necessarily end up that way. They've never been vegan. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I haven't. No, that's, that's a huge, yeah. it's not funny. Oh, I know, it's funny, but it's not. Like, yeah. if, if it's a huge shift. It's a huge change. And so, like, all these revolutionaries have been part of a very fundamentally violent relationship with the world. And so... What do you expect, maybe? Well, like, I also find vegan revolutionaries are more community-based. They're more open to finding out what the public wants and listening to them. But if we adopt violent tactics, is that not adopting a violent view of the world? Like, it just, it doesn't convince me that, that if, uh, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't convince me that if the Russian Revolution had been vegan, Stalin would have never happened. What about self-defense? Like you would defend yourself physically if someone was attacking you, right? Yeah. So, when it comes down to so it, why are we doing that for the animals who are being attacked so systematically? That so what's the gulf there? It's, I, I don't have a good, good answer for that yet. It's a good point. Maybe the animals can't vote. Uh, probably why they, they can't vote, they can't fight back. Yeah. Yeah. They, they 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 rely on us. They can't. They've been so. As I said, it's war that's been so totally won by the victors. There's no possibility of revolution from the oppressed. That they need emissaries and agents on their behalf, whether through voting or through arms, to, to help. It, it's, you make some good points. Um, anybody else on this topic? Anybody? I would have thought there would be a chorus of arguments. Yeah, just, just one thing is the weight of the law is, is against us. Yeah. yeah, that's the fear. I mean, in self-defense, yes. Alright. Uh, I walked in late, so I don't know if you already took this up, but what about, what about the 
destruction of, like, hypothetically, if we could destroy property in a way that doesn't kill yeah. anyone. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not human animals, because... We were talking about the horse slaughterhouse. Yeah, because, like, the horse slaughterhouse, yeah. because, like, if no, if, like, no horses or, like, humans have been killed in that, like, is there any way to argue against it? Yeah, shouldn't there be more and more of that? I, I worry about the burning of a, a slaughterhouse down. This, this might sound a little bit ridiculous, but in every building of that size, there are all kinds of animals who live in there, nested in there. You burn a horse slaughterhouse down, you probably kill several families of mice to begin with. Too. Like, it's, 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 I mean, that's indicative of something maybe that's wrong with that. I mean, I kind of applaud this guy now, Paul. Like, I'm sure a lot of people did. Maybe he wisely picked his target, Jenny, like a horse slaughterhouse, right? It's like, He's bound to have a lot of people, non-vegan, who would say, yeah. And um, so maybe we should start with the horse slaughterhouses and the bunny slaughterhouses, and then work our way up to the chicken and the cow. I do think we should have a lot more destruction of property, like like defacing billboards and posters and, and that. Like everyone, every vegan should have a marker and, and, and a spray cake paint can like cross stuff out and that's that's a kind of it's like a symbolic violence or it's like something in this liminal space between violent and non and it's of ephemeral property too like billboard paper and stuff like that so it's like but it, it, it's it's like co-opting the mechanism of, 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 of media to, to broadcast it and that's there's something to show you a bit more serious there's more. something I could add here which is an interesting point that actually supports both sides of it uh, which is that uh, you might have heard of this, is the, is the idea that in um, revolutionary type movements and civil rights movements, uh, you, you need this diversity of tactics and one actually feeds off the other. So the violent, the, uh, what will happen is society will turn against the violent revolutionaries, like the Black Panthers, say, let's say, and they will, and they will be, go running into the arms of Martin Luther King and the NAACP uh, position because they see things are happening, but they don't want it to happen in that way. They want it to happen in this way. And so mainstream society opts for the non-violent to avoid the violent. But the violent played a role in, they both played a role in the decision. I think we, we could raise the notch up a little bit without resorting to violence. We have to make noise. Okay? We have to annoy the crap out of them. And I think benefiting has its, has its role, but it may not be enough. So we have to, I guess, think of, of intelligent ways of, of, disrupt, of causing disruption without necessarily resorting to violence. Yeah. And I'm thinking of some quick ex examples in my mind. Like, for instance, I saw some people making, making uh, some labels that you can kind of stick to every single yeah. But you go to supermarkets and start sticking them on top of, of piece of uh, uh, meat containers. Uh, when you go to offices, you put uh, uh, the wild one in another in, in the middle of magazines in yeah. office, wherever you go. You know things like you have to kind of bring that uh, that that idea. You have to bring it to mainstream in, in the most different ways. You know, have to, people have to kind of stumble upon them. When, whatever they want, I mean, they, they, as if they can't avoid it, you have to start thinking about it. Not necessarily you have to, to beat one up to, to, get, to get it to understand, to get a person to understand. And that's what I think. Because the, there is really a risk of going out of the way to, to be violent because of uh, law issues being imprisoned, being out of commission, as you said. All those, those things go to one's mind that ended up not. Uh, I'll be favoring the end to, to go back that way, you know. From a, from a personal level, being imprisoned is, is awful. But if, let's say in Toronto, um, 100 people, 100 animal rights activists this year were sentenced to jail for 10 years for doing something radically interventionist, it's maybe not violent, but like really getting in the way of the mechanism of the industry and maybe burning a building or two down, and they're put away for a long time. Okay, they're put out of commission, but it's like a very strong communication a lot of news coverage has happened that year. A lot, like it could, it could really radically change things too, and open up space for for more action and for judicial decisions, like setting precedents of at least a gray area for future judicial decisions. Um, but uh, but I, I agree, Carlos. In a way, yes, but in a way, no. Because when the shop's sad, we're doing. 
Sorry, who was that? The shack seven. They're anti vivisection. Oh, yeah. They're, yeah. they're identified as quote violent, quote. Yeah. Uh, by some people. They were identified as violent and they were arrested. Um, they were arrested and they were taken to the Philippines. Yeah. 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 Wasn't it because of the they were advocating home demos or something? Is that the issue? Or yeah, they were going yeah. after the, the suppliers, like not just okay. They looked at the home network and they went after everyone associated with the network. Oh, okay. so, um, so they just changed the laws to the gov the UK changed the laws against to prevent that. Or? Yeah, well, that's the genesis of the animal. When we have more, when we have more people, mm. it won't it won't be so um, destructive to the movement to have seven or eight people to take off. Lots to take That's off. That's sort of like the movement that's a really big right now. That we're in a, we're in a different place, like yeah. a place of growth, and um, we're developing that. Something, something's changing, for sure, yeah. for sure, and, and uh, the non-violent side of you wants to give that time to you, for sure. Like, uh, <laughs> but the other side of you wants change. You, you, you know, you see, the, you see a certain video or picture and you feel so angry and so, you know, something has to be done. You feel ashamed for not doing more. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, Victoria, are you there? I think, yeah. We're going to take a little break between the uh, um, If you want to, okay. we could. Like five minutes. There's, there's uh, Ian brought some oranges or something, yeah. and there were some uh, crackers and hummus. Do you guys want to take a few minutes or while Victoria is setting up? Yeah, sure. Victoria, stretch your legs. Uh, yeah, this, I can go like right now, but if people want to do it. Or do we just want to go ahead? Or you can go ahead now. Okay, okay. So there are people who are just sitting here, so it's fine. Yeah, we're a little behind, that's fine. That's okay. We might have to sort of do a short, uh, give short shrift to my part, but that's okay. It's not a big deal. Well, we just, everything, you know. It's all right. It's not a big deal. We went 47 minutes. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
more complex thoughts and had uh, much more vibrant lives than a human fetus ever will. Yeah, so, so, so here I just have some funny images. So I have the cop descending Wonka. Oh, we're pro-life because killing is a sin. Tell me how eating meat is a sin in the PETA, the PETA banner, which was, uh, which was uh, a parody of a, a pro-life sticker that some people see around. So, like Peter Singer and Tom, Tom Regan, most vegans and animal rights activists consider the baseline for moral consideration to be sentience. And it's quite obvious that animals that animals are, are sentient. They they can communicate, they socialize, they have they have feelings, they they experience physical pain. Uh, but the line is not so clear with human fetuses at, at all. Uh, embryologists estimate that the earliest age at which a human fetus could could be sentient would be around 18 to 25 weeks, but the overwhelming majority of abortions take place uh, during the, the first trimester, which is one to thirteen weeks. So, so most so most might consider that to be a non-issue. Then, oh, of course you can be pro-choice and you can be vegan. And and, and another another argument that can be put forth in to to argue that you can be pro-choice and an animal rights activist would be that uh, animals are demanding that we give up our bodily autonomy in order to stop exploiting them. Uh, a thought experiment that has been proposed about, about uh, one's bodily integrity and, and whether, whether we must give up our own bodily integrity to, uh, to support the life of another, but it has been the, the violinistic thought experiments where if you imagine that you wake up one day and you're in the hospital and in the bed next to you is another person, you're connected to him by a thin tube, and then the nurse tells you that he's a violinist and that the only way he can sustain his life is if he's connected to you via the tube, and he, he has a wife and he has kids at home and he, he wants to live so badly, and so do you, do you tell him to cut the tube and then he dies, or do you say, Oh, that or you just do, do you decide that his, that his life is more important than that, and so and many would argue that that to demand that someone give up their bodily integrity in order to keep someone else alive is a violation of, of your rights of your right to to not have your body invaded. Uh, so, like even though maybe if you're utilitarian, you would think it's a good thing. We don't go around demanding that pe that people who have two kidneys and two lungs give up one of their kidneys and one of their lungs automatically. <laughs> and, uh, and and often that, that argument's been been applied to abortion as well, that it that it's a violation of a woman's right to bodily integrity if if it's uh, demanded that she that she sacrifice parts of her body for an extended period of time with potential complications and consequences to keep a fetus alive to be an incubator for a fetus. And yeah, yeah so in order to 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 be to be vegan, we, we don't have to sacrifice our, our bodily autonomy to to any significant degree at all and I mean, even though animals are, especially domestic animals, are dependent upon us in many ways, uh, they don't demand invasion of invasion of our, our bodies. So they're they're not similar to fetuses in that way. However, we however uh, it seems that uh, that the pro life argument does coincide with the animal rights argument in some ways because uh, people who who believe in Right, and rights for fetuses will often say that uh, abortion isn't a personal choice because you're because you're violating the right of the, the fetus to live to grow into an adult human being, and that's that's very similar to if you've had an argument with a meat eater and they say that eating meat is their personal choice, but we know it's not a personal choice for them because it because it violates someone else's someone else's life. That we know that they're not the only the only person involved in that decision. And a very common pro-choice argument is that, is that fetuses aren't deserving of ethical consideration because, because they're only potential human beings. They're not, they're not actual persons, they're, they're potential persons. And, 
and uh, therefore they're not they're not equivalent to, in any way to to fully grown human beings, and and they're they're they don't they don't have rights. H however, however, we run into problems here because because for example, when talking about mitigating climate change, environmentalists will will often talk about extending our circle of ethical consideration to future generations. Not just not just people who currently exist, but are not those people pure potentialities, even more than fetuses, one might say. So so we have some difficulties there if we're going to justify ethical concern, extending ethical concern to future generations, to people who don't even exist yet, but not to fetuses as well. And and it's also it's also a very very complex situation, like not only because the vast majority of animal rights activists are are women, and many of them are atheists and agnostics, but but also there have been arguments that a minority position in the animal rights movement is arguments from religious ethics that uh, that speak of a sanctity, the sanctity of life, and they see animals as included in that. So, so it really hinges on, hinges on whether on, on whether uh, the the fetus, by by virtue of being a potential human being and of eventually growing into a human being, is is worthy of of ethical consideration, or whether you choose sentience as the baseline. And yeah, now I'm going to move in with the the issues with PETA. Yeah, so. I'm pretty sure most of us have seen PETA's ads and the choices that they use to to spread their message. This here is a picture of Carol Adams. Uh, she's she's a very prominent prominent uh, feminist who believes in animal rights. She's the author of the Sexual Politics of Meat and the Pornography of Meat, and her and basically her argument is that is that there are connections between. The objectification of women, animal exploitation, and meat eating, and she says that the process of turning living individual animals into into meat in a, in a slaughterhouse is very similar to to the way that uh, to, to the way that women are commodified and presented as and pre and presented as things to be bought and consumed consumed in porn and in the sex industry and. And this is this is kind of the groundwork for comparisons between misogyny and speciesism. However, some have accused PETA of of using those same tactics in order to in order to give the the animal movement a voice within a culture that is patriarchal and speciesist. For example, Corey Red in a piece that she wrote for the website Sociological Images, she said that this process works within the vegan movement as well. With an open embracing of veganism is inherently feminized and sexualized, this works to undermine a movement that is comprised mostly of women and repackage it for a patriarchal society. Instead of strong political collective of women, we have yet another demographic of sexually available women who exist for male consumption. So she has a very damning critique of PETA, and she can, she is very critical of what she calls uh, of what she calls an attempt to make veganism sexy, to repackage it as sexy, and uh, and she says that that defangs the movement by by buying into patriarchal society's expectations of what women should be like. So, uh, in case no one has seen it, these are examples of PETA's advertising. Uh, we have yeah, there's Pamela Anderson being chopped up by a butcher, a butcher chart. She's literally dismembered there, and uh, yeah, it's the, the I'd rather show my bumps than wear fur. So, so this is so this is related to the debate between radical feminism and liberal feminism, or what has also been called sex positive sex positive feminism. There, there are two sides where. Where there are, there are feminist arguments for these types of these types of media and against uh, radical feminism, also called second wave second wave feminism, is associated with thinkers like Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon, where they were very critical of porn and prostitution, and 
and, and, uh, and a reaction to that was third wave feminism, also called liberal feminism or sex positive feminism, which is associated with uh, Foucault and Judith Butler, who whose work was drawn upon, and uh, third wave feminism emphasizes women's agency and. And, sec and third wave or sex positive feminists will often argue that these types of media actually actually aren't anti-feminist because uh, the women who are like the women who are modeling for, for those advertise advertisements chose to do it out of their own free will, and it would be anti-feminist to try to dictate what they're doing. And yeah, so liberal feminism uh, came out of it came came as a response to the marginalization that especially uh, gay, lesbian, uh, transgender, and and bisexual and other queer people felt within feminist circles. Uh, uh, feminist circles, they they felt that they were marginalized, that the spectrum of human human sexual diversity wasn't wasn't embraced, and also and also it came came about as a reaction to. What were perceived as very negative attitudes to human sexuality in the work of the radical feminists. So, so these are very laudable goals, but there have been numerous criticisms of sex positive feminism put forth by the older radical feminists, where they, they will accuse they will accuse sex positive feminism as of of assuming that consent takes place in a vacuum that. Uh, of ignoring these social factors that condition women's choices, and as Catherine McKinnon, McKinnon put it, like if you're a fish in water, you don't know that there's water around around you, and women in a patriarchal society uh, don't see sexual objectification everywhere, and and also and also they criticize sex positive feminists especially in their positive attitudes towards porn and prostitution as complying with capitalism's commodification of women and 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 they have they have also claimed that sex positive feminism can marginalize women who have had primarily negative experiences of sex However, I think that even from a more liberal feminist perspective, there are definitely issues with the kind of advertising that PETA uses because uh, because their ads prevent a very normative idea of what female female beauty and female sexuality is supposed to is supposed to look like. Uh, most of the women in their ads are thin, blonde, white, able-bodied, cisgender, heterosexual, or passing for such, or shaped, and. And also, they're they're very clearly they're very clearly put there for the heterosexual male gaze, and and, and we can't. I don't think that we can say that this is just that it's just a coincidence that they haven't used, uh, say, models of color, or disabled models, or uh, or trans women, because we can see in other advertisements that they've made that they've portrayed women of color in very dehumanizing ways, or that they've. They've used uh, trans women or unshaved women or fat women as objects of objects of disgust and fear. So it's an it's an irony that th this organization is using these oppressive these oppressive and conservative assumptions about uh, about gender, about race, about about about, sexu about sexuality, about uh, ability and appearance in, in order to raise awareness about the oppression of animals. I, I put some examples of the type, the type of attitudes that PETA has about women who don't conform to, to normative Western beauty ideals here. So we have a model of color. She's holding a sign that says exotic animals belong in the, belong in the wild, not in zoos. And this is, this is problematic because in this particular culture, we're told that women of color aren't beautiful and that we can't look at them as beautiful in the way that, for example, that white women can be looked at as beautiful, they have to be exotified all the time, and that's the only way that they can be appreciated. And going, going clockwise, uh, PETA did a fur campaign in which they, they photographed they, they photographed cross-dressers and they called it fur as a drag, and it's obviously quite transphobic, but they saw that that was okay because they were they were using this this uh, the stereotype in order to, to raise awareness about how animals suffer in, in the fur industry. 
And then uh, there's the, the infamous, infamous Save, Save the Whales, where they, they prey on society's fear of, of fat and of fat women in, in, in order to... In, 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 in order to try to, to get people to become vegans, and then there's the, the fur trim and unattractive ad in which, in which a woman with, with unshaved pubic hair is looked upon as an object of disgust. And, yeah, and I wanted to, to bore it a little bit into the, the controversy of fat phobia in the, in the vegan and animal rights movement, uh, for, for example, in, in, an article, in an article for Salon, Julie Klosner was describing the Skinny Bitch, which is a vegan cookbook, and she said the relentless bullying peppered throughout the author's advice accounts for much of the book's humor, including quips like, you need to exercise, you lazy shit, obvious for pussies, and don't be a fat pig anymore. It was a formerly anorexic friend of mine who nailed it when she read excerpts from the book. When you have an eating disorder, she told me, that's the voice you hear in your head all the time. So... So even though this so so even though this community is trying to to raise awareness about the oppression of animals, like there are serious issues about how about how, about how certain certain women are looked upon, and like even though like like I, I would agree with the the idea that we delegitimize the movement by by uh, buying into uh, like these. These, uh, these patriarchal ideas. And, and I just wanted to point out that often the advertisements take on a far more disturbing tone than the I would show my, my, my buns instead of fur, fur kind of thing. Uh, here, here I have a, a couple... So, oh, oh, did it? Something happened to it. <laughs> Of, for the majority of, 
of people or animals, uh, of persons. Whereas a deontological thinker would think that your means must be consistent with your ends, and two, to use morally dubious means would be to undermine your ends. So, so that's completely unacceptable. And so a utilitarian would, position would be that upon consideration of the extremity of the oppression that that billions of animals go through every day, these tactics are these tactics can and should be used because we should be doing everything in our power, as Paul Valley pointed out earlier, maybe including violence in order to try to try to end end what they're facing. Yeah, and so, so the deontological position would be that would be that we can't possibly fight the oppression of a, of other beings by that we can't possibly fight the oppression of, of one marginalized group while perpetuating the oppression of others. So yeah, yeah. So I decided to make part of this PETA's explanation why it uses nudity in its advertising taken from the frequently asked questions on PETA's website. Our mission is to get the animal rights message to as many people as possible. Unfortunately, this is not always an easy task. Unlike our opposition, which is mostly composed of wealthy industries and corporations, PETA must rely on getting free advertising through media coverage. This can be especially difficult with our fur campaign, since newspapers are are often reluctant to cover activities for fear of use, you, losing couriers advertising dollars, but not surprisingly colorful and controversial demonstrations and campaigns like activists tripping to go naked instead of wearing fur consistently grab headlines. And this shows PETA, I think, to be utilitarian in its approach, which is consistent with other things, we, other stances that we know PETA has taken on other issues, for example, with regards to breed-specific legislation with regards to, to euthanasia and to the ab abolition, abolitionist versus welfareist issue. For example, like even though there was a huge outcry over this, PETA gave uh, an award to Temple Grandin because they felt that even though she eats meat and perpetuates uh, the killing of animals for human consumption, what, what she did uh, maximized I, I guess the, the happiness of as many animals as she could and created the least amount of pain for the animals. And, and, and uh, with regards to euthanasia, like even though even though like a person with a more rights-based approach to ethics would argue that it's a violation of the animal's rights to continue to live, they think that it's they think that it's a responsible thing to euthanize uh, the animals in their care because they will no longer suffer. And, and with regards to breed-specific legislation, which is which is kind of surprising for ostensibly an animal rights group, but they, they encourage breed specific legislation because they figure that, uh, for, for example, like pit bulls that will be banned, they'll just be killed instead of living in terrible conditions. So they, that makes it right for them in the end. Yeah, so I'm go going to open up it up to questions now. Thank you for listening. Yes, I, I've heard that argument, but it still seems to me overwhelmingly to be female nudity. And like, if you, if you even look at the the men that they show, it's a very normative idea of what it means to be male. Uh, they, yeah, they. Were, I know that they recently did a campaign where they showed uh, nude gay male models, but but still, like, if you look at the like, I, I but I feel that. Uh, like that seems to me almost to be a kind of pink washing thing because if I look at like other stances that they've taken on LGBT issues, like for example when they did the first a drag campaign, like which is very obviously transphobic, I like I think that that's part of PETA, uh, PETA just trying to seize, you know, just tr tr just trying to like seize whatever ideas current in popular opinion and and like not necessarily any any kind of like social responsibility. Yeah, I think you're right. Like, <clears throat> I've heard it described as like the the landscape is very crowded. So, in order to get a 
attention, but it's like they don't put any um, value or moral weight on the attention. Exactly. It's just like exactly. Attention. Yeah, yeah, the, because they, they see, like, for, for them, for them basically, like, no, no attention to negative attention, and they, they see, they basically see whatever's popular without thinking about the ethical implications, implications of it, I would, I would agree. Richard Carson, Rick said, any publicity is good publicity. Yeah, yeah, exactly, like, I was, I was going to say that, because Ingrid justifies all of it, because... And, and I mean, like, it does, it is an argument with some weight, because she thinks that considering the, the extreme forms of oppression that animals undergo every day, and compared to, I mean, I mean, like, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a proper thing to compare oppressions, but consider, but in comparison to all of the suffering that human, human beings that have been marginalized have undergone, like, animals, like, experience some of the most extreme and degrading forms of oppression ever, and I guess from that perspective, Ingrid thinks that, therefore, anything goes, and we should, it would be wrong not to use whatever means we can, but, but from a social justice perspective, when you see, when you see, like, like, and you think that, that how could we try to lessen the oppression of one group if we become complicit in the oppression of others? say that they would have never become a uh, vegan, let alone vegetarian, if they had never seen one of PETA's undercover videos. And, like, I, I really, I totally understand that. Yeah. So, so it is, it is very conflicted. I mean, like, if you think of, like, who's out there, like, trying to, to help animals, I mean, PETA has, I mean, PETA's the loudest and gets the most attention, and that's immediately what, what people, what people gravitate towards. Yeah. And... Yeah, yeah, so, so it is. Yeah, they, it doesn't they mean take, that way. The, the thing is, that they do, they take a lot of positions on a lot of issues, and they have a number of tactics that they use, which are, like you said, mostly utilitarian and practical. Uh, but they call themselves an animal rights group, which is an irony, because if they... If they're they not believe, 100% for rights. They're yeah. Because, rights. because they, yeah, they're, they're utilitarians, they don't believe in rights. They're, they're, they're also very welfare. But anyway... Um, I have actually, later on, if we get to it, uh, another controversial topic they're involved in, which is the, uh, their stance against uh, uh, no-kill shelters, and that's controversial too. But the, uh, I wanted to go back to your first part, which is the pro-life, pro-choice yeah. thing. And uh, <clears throat> that, that is a complicated, <laughs> very controversial. The thing is, last time we did this, we had two men came up, and one was a Christian animal rights guy, and the other was an atheist animal rights guy, and they debated this, and one, the Christian, is pro-life. And these. Since then, I've actually met or run into people who are pro-life, but not Christian, which is the first. So usually it's associated with a religious position, but not necessarily. This other person I ran into was a woman, who said I follow what's called the consistent life ethic. And I had to look that up. I didn't know what it was. But it's anti-nuclear, pro-life, animal rights, and against capital punishment. So life across yeah. the board. It's human and non-human. I mean, that's interesting. And, but, the, but what I liked about what you said is that you brought in the issue of sentence. And when we did this poor, I, I had to sort of research it and... According to some doctors, sentience, if we say that that's the criteria for moral considerability, it doesn't kick in until 18 to 24 weeks, apparently. Yeah. Uh, something like that. It's on the other side. Yeah. Now, if that's true, that means that in the first trimester, when most of the abortions occur, the uh, oh, well, fetus yes. is not sentient. So only the potentiality argument applies. Yeah, yeah but, then, but it also, 
Yes, yes, absolutely. But but also we run into we, we run into other tricky issues. Like for example, Peter Singer recently said that vegans should be okay with eating oysters by the barrel because they're not sentient, they have no central nervous system and they don't feel pain apparently. But they are animals. But they're animals. Right. Or most vegans would consider them to be and most vegans don't eat oysters. So so from one from a utilitarian Peter Singer point of view, it might be acceptable. He also was I think he came out very controversially in favor of, uh, uh, what was it? What was his issue, the issue that everybody attacked him on? Oh, uh, infanticide? Yes, yes because he, he, yeah, because he believes that, he believes that it should be legal and he thinks that it's morally permissible to, to kill infants because he doesn't see them as fully sent you. Uh, another issue that he didn't raise, but what could be raised is, uh, and, and I'm, and, just to like preface, I'm not taking a position for an Easter yeah, or yeah. anything, but there is an issue which is um, the mis when we did our misanthropic lecture, well, there's too many humans, right? So maybe, you know, maybe it would be, it's good that uh, we're not having more babies by whatever means possible. We want to argue, right? Yeah. Uh, that, and then they'll just grow up to be harnessed and all this stuff, right? But what if they turn up, you know, to be great animal rights activists. So I think there's, you can hurt that too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think it's, it's, it's obviously like... very, it's like a, it's, anyway, you don't run into too many, uh, run into too many pro-life animal rights people, but they do exist. Yeah. Both religious and secular, and that's interesting, and that's yeah. why it's a topic. Yeah, but also, focus. like, I hate, I hate to bring this up because it's kind of a cliche, cliche but what about plants? Because if you decide that, uh -huh. Because if you decide that your ethics are based on like a reverence for life, where do plants fall into that? <laughs> I'm actually surprised that I, I, I am surprised that it, it's so rare to find people who are in the animal movement that are, are some version of pro-life. I mean, yeah, there does seem to be some lurking potential, egregious contradiction there, which you're which you're addressing potential, and I think I think you know the. Um, Question of sentience is, is key. I mean, most people who are, who are animal rights um, take sentience to be the key. Yes. Oh, and, and, and so, I mean, maybe that the overwhelming majority are formed in the first trimester, but there's still statistically an awful lot that aren't, and they're getting to that yeah. area. And so, what you what you actually I'm just making a sociological statement. What you actually expect to find if consistency is driving people's selection of positions is most pro animal people would be very would be pro life. Vocal, to some well, would be very vocally against abortions after, say, 14 weeks or whenever you get into that gray area. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah. you know, it's like they'd be very strongly against that. But in fact, you don't find that. You find, because in my casual, you know, like, because sociological <laughs> research, it's like, it's, it's, it's like very consistently pro life, and they, they're not willing to even broach the question of you mean the gray choice. area with, within pro choice, sorry, uh, the question of whether there's a gray area there. Three trimesters. Yeah. And then on the other hand, um, gray area is the second. The third is illegal. So that's not even on the table. Yeah, yeah. Third, third trimester abortion yeah. is illegal. And yeah. in yeah. most states, second life. trimester abortions can be very hard to get as well. Right. Yeah. 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 But I thought it was most compelling well, when you were talking about the future. So the yeah, yeah, because I find, I find because, that one gets me a lot. Especially for climate veganism. <laughs> you're heading down that road. Because really, you're talking about your grandchildren and, and future yeah. generations. Yeah, right? that's, what, that's what you're trying So, I, I mean, I hadn't really thought about it until Victoria brought it up, but it's a very um, powerful kind of. It does, it does contribution. How can we not um, yeah. care about fetus, but then care about. Right. It's about moral, moral, moral consistency. That's the issue there. And, uh, but, yeah. But it, 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 so that's why it's controversial. <laughs> right? <laughs> but in arguing climate veganism, then, um, one of the main arguments is because it, it's for the future. And it's like you're, you're trying to scare people that the future, the future that is leading to the grandchildren. Well, you can be a misanthropic climate vegan or a humanistic <laughs> climate vegan. <laughs> Which position do you take? Yeah. I think Katie, Katie, Katie no, I, no, I, 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 I was saying, for me, it comes down to sustainability. Continues to go on a rise without, well, without you know, slowing down at all. The planet just can't sustain. So I mean, pro-choice 
choice just makes sense. Because you know, we can't. We can't have it. Especially if the women don't have someone to properly raise the child, the child is just put into the system. But if it's ki- if it's if it's killing, you're not willing to make that argument. Like you're not willing no. to say, um, kill anyone over the age of seventy or whatever because of the population pressure thing, right? So no. if it's killing, and that's maybe an, an if, you wouldn't be willing to make that argument for population. I I'm, I'm against the uh, life support and stuff like that. Yeah. I would continue to keep people on life support if they're yeah. not going to continue to be part of the community, you know what I mean? Like so there, really? there's also the issue of somebody wants to live in best club anyway? No, I mean like like the brain dead and like not living and they're not being part of the community in any way. I mean if you have a mentally handicapped person, that's different. But if you have a vegetable, you know, there's so many vegetables living in hospitals that are just fucking up the system. I think the same thing with the children. I think it should be a pro-choice thing. Don't you, don't you, don't you worry about, like, there being some kind of mystery to consciousness? Like, we're, history has told us so many times, oh, don't worry, the animals aren't conscious at all. And, oh, wait, they are, sorry. Scratch that. <laughs> yeah. And then we're told, well, the brain dead. Look, there's no, there's no, the line isn't moving. The line on the machine isn't moving, therefore there's no <laughs> consciousness. Like, oh, okay, Mr. Doctor, um, whatever you're saying. Yeah. And, then, and then we find, oh, no, there actually are. And, and so don't you worry these, like, gray areas in the beginning of life and the end of life. Uh, that's that's true. With which, like, we've seen the history. history. Yeah, for yeah. 12 years. Yeah, yeah. 12 years. He, was, he claims to have been conscious the entire yeah. 12 yeah. years, even though to our appearance. And he was tortured by the same programs being played over and over again on his TV or something. Yeah. Or the same music being played or something oh like that. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. How horrible. Yeah. And people who wake up from surgeries and, uh, well, well, apparently some, some, um, anesthetization is So you're paralyzed, and you're feeling it, and then you forget about it. Um, but for that guy who was brain, you're saying, you know, he was brain dead for 15 years or whatever, he wasn't, I don't know, if that was, I work in the veterinary community, and if that was an animal, we wouldn't keep that animal alive. I Why would we keep a human alive? alive a vegetable? I would be, like, in my will, I'll say, like, please kill me. Yeah. <laughs> Please remove the... And let the someone space. else take on that medical space. Well, it's hard to it's think easy to say. <laughs> it's easy to say when you're out of the bed, but I had an uncle with ALS, and he said from the very get-go that he didn't want to be revived. But when it came down to the crunch, he did. Mm-hmm. That's different. Being revived, was he brain dead for a period of time, or was he dying at that moment in time? It was a very him? complicated situation. So that's different. It's a complicated situation. I'm saying people that, you know, like the fetus, they don't really necessarily contribute to society at all. They're just but, but also, but also like to that I would say, like when you talk about contribution to society, like I think it's very problematic when we start facing uh, how ethically how how ethically considerable someone is on whether they contribute to society or not because because like I we have uh, to like kill it's, a lot of people that yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, because, like, some people, I don't know, like, like my wording, my wording is wrong at that point, but I still, they mentally challenge people, if they can express emotion and feel emotion and things like that, they still have the right to live and things, you know, we can't say that they're any different than yeah. an animal, right? But I'm just saying, if you have a brain-dead animal that's on life support, you have a brain-dead human that's on life support, you're going to keep the human alive and keep the animal alive? Or would you just put them both out? I think what you're yeah. saying is a quality of life argument. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and actually, PETA takes that position with regard to the. That's yeah, why they're against the the high the high kill shelter. Uh, no kill no, shelter. No kill right. shelter. They're, they're not for rights, strictly speaking, because if you're strictly speaking for rights, you're for the rights to live no matter what. Therefore, quality of life, which is essentially welfareism, and so. Uh, so what you're describing, in a sense, is human welfareism, I would say, or it's quality, okay. quality of life issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I told you we wouldn't be able to resolve these issues. <laughs> no, I don't know. I'll let you start to... Yeah. Um, yes, so it's about a bit of a different point. I did that experiment about abortion. Um, I'm not sure to see how the argument works, because if we could as the fetus was supposed to walk in to talk to us, would have a symmetrical situation where the preference of the, of the mother who wanted to, wanted to abort would, would be a violation of the body integrity of the fetus. And so the only reason the situation is not in this kind of symmetrical way is that, well, we can, we can talk to, to a 
if it is an ascension because, well, A, there's a physical barrier, and B doesn't speak any of her languages. But I just, I just don't see how either of those, of these, of those facts is morally relevant. Mm. Uh, it's like the integrity of the mother versus the integrity of the fetus. Yeah, so, so, so well, the, the issue would hinges on bodily autonomy because the idea that is that, like, is that you shouldn't, that it's a violation of your rights for someone to demand that your body be invaded in order to support the life of another because, I mean, like, we could, all, all of us here have two lungs and two big kidneys could, could, uh, could save the lives of quite a few people if we were to give up one of each, but, but, like, we don't do that because it's thought that, because, because it's thought that that would be a massive violation of our, of our rights for someone to, to decide for us that we should do that. Well, if the fetus, is, so you're saying it, even if the fetus had a right to life, it, it could be, it could be, uh, com it could be completely, um, overturned by, by the mother's right to, to, uh, not have her body invaded. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I guess it depends on whether you think the fetus's right to be alive is more important. And it, and it hinges on what, what you think a, a person is as well, what, also what, what criteria you would... Whether, whether the <coughs> mother consensually took it on by having sex. True. Open, open her up to that. Yeah. I mean, culture places great, great prohibitions around sexuality, in part because it has mm -hmm. such momentous consequences, some of the time. Mm -hmm. Any last thoughts on... These talk the gender issues. You have something to say, yeah? No? It wasn't resolved. <laughs> Not resolved, let's move on to this. Well, I think it's you know what, it's okay that they're not resolved because yeah, thank you, Victoria, that was good. Oh, thank you. What I'm always amazed is how you can actually throw together presentations so fast. <laughs> and they're so thorough, like it's unbelievable. Thank you. Wow. <sighs> You're, you're going to be a great professor one of these days. Great. So I'm just going to try to burn through these other things. Now, I was supposed to take on, uh, first of all, Paul is going to take on religion. We didn't get to that. A religion versus atheism, right? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, we haven't I talked just, about that yet. No, I just decided to focus that's on okay. That's okay, yeah. yeah. Depth is better than breadth, maybe, but... The, uh, let me just quickly summarize a lot of issues that we won't absolutely, we'll, we'll skim the surface here. First of all, the religion thing. Okay, well, a lot of the animal rights people are atheists, and, um, and they, that's a position that is taken as ethically consistent and with animal rights because religion, uh, you know, say Christianity is very anthropocentric, and all human cultures are pretty much. Uh, even even the eastern ones, and uh, it's seen as uh, speciesism is uh, <coughs> is is part and parcel of a religious worldview that is uh, dated and so secular. So it's no mistake that animal rights arose within the Enlightenment and uh, is consistent with the history of uh, secularism. At the same time, there is a Christian animal rights movement, a Jewish animal rights movement, even an is Muslim animal rights movement, Buddhist engaged Buddhism. Jainism, of course, is famous for having a sort of a, a non-animal uh, use, uh, you know, ahimsa and so forth. Uh, although there are, are elements of speciesism, species within it, such as higher human rebirths. But uh, the uh, there are there's a reformation of a lot of these uh, traditions or uh, towards an animal rights ethic, but it's often framed as theos rights, which is not animal rights per se, but uh, the, view, the view that animals have rights in, insofar as they belong to God or, or God's creation. But the more traditional religious worldview is that is more consistent with what's called animal welfareism, where uh, it's about the uh, better treatment of animals. So that would lead to something like halal or kosher slaughter viewed as better than non-halal or kosher, of course, now in the modern industrial age that's contested, but 
uh, there, but it has, the fact that it is contested has led some Christians and Jews, for example, to say that we need to, that a real halal and real kosher means no animal use at all. And to be a good Jew means to be a vegan. But that's a minority position. And uh, you think, definitely can make a strong case for the idea that, um, that uh, uh, religions are anthropocentric and they are specious and, uh, and that's why there's so many animal rights atheists, right? So that kind of, kind of sums, sums up an entire course in like a few sentences, <laughs> okay? Uh, right. So uh, these are polarizing issues. You'll have a lot of debates on Facebook over them, you know? <laughs> each other over these issues, yeah. okay? Yeah. Uh, because of losses of Facebook friends. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Uh, so, you know what? I would say that's a good thing. You know why? Because it's good for movements to have, di to have diversity of opinion. If we all thought the same way, we wouldn't be in a real political movement for social change, would we? We would all be just ideologues who all think the same way, and that's bad for this movement. Diversity of views is good for the movement. So we're gonna say that. Right? Make the movement more effective. Uh, yeah, we would be more we effective. All the same way. It, we would true. Like, We'd be a, like a mindless army of audible thoughts. <laughs> <and, laughs> yeah. No, it's true. Though I, you're right. We would, but I think the diversity is good because it leads to creativity. It leads to, and it attracts people. There are many conservative animal rights people. There are religious. There are atheists. There are. There's a number of intersectional points of interest on every field of human endeavor. Uh, which helps us to constantly redefine what animal rights is uh, and, to, and, and for, to try to bring in a lot of perspectives, and that's a good thing. And it also helps us to really define it by saying, well, it's not this. Is animal rights, and that leads me to my next topic, welfareism versus abolitionism, probably the biggest controversial topic in terms of the sheer number of people weighing on both sides. Um, so I'm not going to be able to give it justice, but the idea here is that uh, uh, oh yeah, see, these are other topics. Uh, is, is, is the treatment of animals in China racist? Can't get to that. Uh, but you'll have different points of view on both. Uh, but let me just cover welfareism. I don't know if I have my slideshow for that welfareism. Since then, I, I took that picture of Bill Clinton. He stopped being a vegan. Okay. Sorry for this. Did you give a whole lecture on? I did all this stuff. Oh, yeah. So I'm just going back to the old one. Uh, anyway, forget it. I'll just I'll find it later. Here's basically. So everybody here knows what abolition and welfare is. is. Does anybody here not know what those things mean? More or less? Well, actually, I'd like you to define it. All right, I'll try my best. <laughs> uh, abolitionism is often defined as through the phrase empty cages. Uh, there should be no animal slavery whatsoever. Um, and so it's, it's, it's identified with the rights, the position of rights, uh, or the rights argument. And uh, it's, 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 those rights are said to be inalienable. You can't take them away. And so the animals, the non-human animals who are sentient already have those rights. They're not given to them. They already have them. And then it's just really a matter of making sure that they're free. Uh, and of course, freedom is a relative term. Uh, but uh, because, you know, a lot of them are domestic animals who need care, say, such as dogs, who wouldn't be able to exist on their own but in the wild. But they're... Uh, but it, 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 so what it practically would mean is ensuring also quality of life for some animals and for wild animals, leaving them alone. Uh, but abolitionism means the uh, no more use of animals as a means to an end of human utility. Uh, even horseback riding or use of honey or any things that are, that are not, the, the reason why they would be considered uh, against abolitionism, against that perspective. Is, is because they still entail the instrumental use of the animal. So it's fundamentally against the instrumental use, uh, whatever that is, even a benign use of horseback riding. So 
are relatively benign. Uh, and uh, abolition is a term that is actually used, was used to describe the uh, people who were against human slavery and the antebellum South. So they called themselves abolitionists because they were for the abolition of slavery. So abolitionism is, is, is a recalling that history. Welfareism is the view that is much more popular in our society, and there's, but there's different types of welfareism. It means the uh, better quality of life uh, for the animal, but the animal in certain, certain circumstances is still understood to be used for human utility, but to treat them well or to kill them well as well is one form of it. There is a spectrum of welfareism. Uh, sometimes it's called incrementalism because it's, the thought is that it might lead to abolitionism. The spectrum ranges, so you have a disingenuous welfareism that is used, say, by the animal agriculture industry to say, well, um, we treat them humanely. And, the, and there's even laws that refer to humane treatment in animal welfare, but in no way, shape, or form could be said to actually be followed to be humane if we really say that humane means merciful and uh, beneficent. But then uh, the, uh, the other end of the spectrum is the, an animal rights person who is a welfareist. And you can be a welfareist and for animal rights at the same time. So let's talk with Anita Kreitz today, for example. She says, I'm both. And most people I know in this movement are both. They think that the better treatment of animals is a good thing and animal rights and free animal in abolition of, of animal slavery is a good thing. So they see welfareism as leading incrementally to abolitionism. Uh, but I, I found it very helpful when David Steibel gave this talk uh, some time ago in which he distinguished between many, what he called many incrementalism and maximum incrementalism is a response to Gary Francione, who's a very, who's a philosopher who's very famous for opposing all welfareism, period, and, and advocating only abolitionism and attacking anybody he views as taking a welfareist position. David's response was to say, in this spectrum of welfareism, oops, I'm getting out of the camera here. In this spectrum of welfareism, uh, you have the sort of the, the worst aspect of it, which would say be represented by Temple Grandin, who is reforming the slaughterhouses to make the killing slightly more humane. Uh, but then is used, her reforms are used by slaughterhouse managers, such as at St. Helens Slaughterhouse, to say, well, it's okay what we're doing because Temple Grandin did these reforms. So welfareism is used as a pretext of, or to justify further animal slavery. It doesn't lead incrementally to abolitionism. On the other end of the spectrum, maxi-incrementalism, uh, David calls it, says that, um, you know, I would say a good example is getting rid of gestation crates. Nobody can really reasonably argue against that. Uh, maybe Gary Francian might, but it would be reasonable for him to do that because really uh, it would be good. It's absolutely, it's a good thing to get rid of gestation crates to increase the quality of life of these poor uh, sows, right? Even if the sows continue to be enslaved. Uh, and you could argue that by you know, mercy for animal actually bringing that gestation crate arg uh, argument out in the public, which they did, and got media attention for it, that that plants the seed in people's minds that maybe, well, if the pig is suffering so much, maybe we really shouldn't eat them, right? But uh, the Francione type of argument would be, well, <laughs> people will eat them more because uh, they think it's okay because now they're not being treated so badly. So you see the two uh, sides, that's why it's controversial, right? Because you can take it either way. Is it a good thing, or is welfare a good thing or a bad thing? And everybody has a strong opinion on this, which is why it's our, one of our controversial topics. And uh, but my point here is, I think it can they can be reconciled if it's sort of a maxi incrementalist view that uh, in one end it's viewed as one leading to another. But if if it's a if it's sort of a mini incrementalist view, then it can definitely uh, be used by the animal exploitation industry to justify what it's doing, and it is. That is that does happen. So we have to distinguish, perhaps. That's maybe the point. What do you think? I just wonder, like the whole welfare versus abolition, is it just why are they necessarily framed that way? Because people, it's thought that people will put too much energy into like welfareism and then not put enough energy into abolition, or is it the 
the idea is people can work on both, both uh, arms at the same time. But, uh, what do you think? <laughs> I think it, uh, yeah, no, well, I think there's no proof that welfareism leads to abolition. There's never been an example that's really shown that to me. So, um, what, generally, sorry, what did you say on the abolition side? You can argue. Did you say that it does lead to it or it doesn't lead to it? Sorry. I don't see any proof that it does necessarily oh, okay. lead to it. Um, but so I, you're so you're saying there's no the incremental, idea. there's no inter incrementalism that is occurring. But it doesn't make sense for the liberal as a perpetrator. Possibly. They actually have to like make more because room because I've heard. Well, not if you adopt uh, Francis Sweeney's argument that people feel that this has a good quality of life, then the consumption might go up. So it might not work out the way you think it will. I was just thinking that maybe the way they, with like welfareism, like I'm not so much for welfareism either, but I'm like arguing for it would be like it makes it makes it more financially like they have to invest into it. And how they are as it is. Right. Yeah. Well, um, actually, Francione voted against the position in California, so he voted against the abolition of SSU free. But um, we should think about something I wrote around Marx about, that I don't remember uh, with, in which case was, but um, when Bernie Gates were, um, were uh, out of I think maybe it was somewhere else, but he, he, he said that afterwards, egg sales went up. Carol Brown is very anti-welfare, definitely in his views. Yeah, and you know, I have other AR friends who are pro-welfare in their views, so there's a, I run into the spectrum of views on this myself. Yeah. Yeah, but I, if, yeah. if, if, we, if we could see if this phenomenon actually reduces itself, and in other similar occasions, there might be a really good case against welfareism in the context. I think this, the case that is argued for welfareism quite often is, is that it's pragmatic, that it is what our society is really ready to accept now for, uh, because everybody, you know, if you ask the average meat eater, are you for animal cruelty? They're like, no, of course not. So are you for the humane treatment of animals? Yes. But they're not for animal rights. And so, it's a pragmatic argument about what would work for the animal's interests right now, uh, short of actually freeing them, which of course everybody who is for animal rights is for. So it's a practical argument, but the question is, does it actually go against animal rights by allowing people to continue to justify animal slavery? And Harold Brown, say, might argue that it might, yeah. Uh, well, I, would, I shouldn't speak for Harold Brown, but I have seen comments from him. I would worry maybe that it's not that humanitarianism is with, with an inconsistent or um, really sort of watered down humanitarianism where you're sending this false message to the public that if you just got rid of gestation crates, that would be enough. In fact, you know, when you ask the, the, the carnists, are you in favor of animal cruelty? And they say, well, actually, a lot of them say they're just food, they're food animals and it doesn't matter about Actually, a lot of them say that. Yeah, uh, but, but but the ones, you know, the more at least um, publicly decent ones, who say, "No, I'm not in favor of animal cruelty." Isn't our obligation then, as humanitarians, to show them that the full implication of their own humanitarianism is abolition? Right. That in fact, there's no way to be humanitarian in your attitude towards the animals and think that just getting rid of gestation crates is enough. I mean, the fact is, to raise animals for food. <laughs> We've already, it's like, we've already enslaved them, we've already taken control of their sexual lives, and then we've already done like 400 things um, which are anti-humanitarian, just to have them in that situation where we're asking crates or no crates. So, it, it, in other words, it's not like it's a false dichotomy exactly, but it's, there's something strange going on here which I don't quite understand, which is, it's, it's just, it's just showing people the full implications of humanitarianism, and that, that leads to abolition. Yeah, I think the problem with the Francione position is that it leads to kind of a paralysis. Uh, and that, that is because where, what do you change? If people aren't going to actually go away, where do you get your reforms happening? The reforms, 
the, from the welfare's position are what lead to the change in consciousness. Uh, so, so uh, to use the analogy of civil rights, you know, you, 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 there's incremental steps in the legislation and the activism that eventually leads to, uh, you know, uh, desegregation and, and, and equal rights. But it, it is sort of this slow process. Now, um, so I, I get it, that's the pro welfare argument, but it, it, there is, there in, in that analog, there were also a lot of people who were saying, well, what you're doing is not going far enough and we need to go much further, and they were kind of like analogous to the uh, abolitionists. Um, and, and this actually is tied in very much with the whole tactics of violence and nonviolence. Mm -hmm. So, for example... It took a war. It's, huh? It took the Civil War to end slavery. Yeah. That's where I'm going with that. Like, right, right. Um, no, there, there's... It didn't matter if the slaves were treated better. It wasn't an incremental thing. Right, it was, right. Uh, Yeah, well, there are, I would say, if in animal rights, uh, you would see basically a lot of people who are opting for violent tactics or militant tactics, violent or nonviolent, are going to be abolitionists and they've rejected welfareism as a route because they're seeing that it's leading nowhere. And that's their view. I guess maybe, maybe here, here's one element of the, uh, the falseness of the dichotomy. Maybe I'm projecting here my own reasonableness. <laughs> Very few people would be upset with the welfare reforms. The question is, as a matter of strategy, are we going to be put, putting our effort into a dialogue at the bargaining table, uh, a welfare position, or are we going to bargain, start with a strong position of abolition, and then maybe by the time the bargain is done in this round or this decade, it ends up with just no more gestation crates. But the question, and then we're like, okay, well, that's better than. I'm glad there are no gestation. Most people are like, okay, I'm glad there are no gestation crates now. That doesn't make me welfareist. My impulse and my goal is still abolition, and that's still what I argue for and put my energy into. But I think a lot of us are like this, right? We, we're arguing for and asking for abolition, but we're happy with the incremental results as being better than nothing. There, there, was, a, there was a good scene in the movie. Um, what was that, that AR movie that was fictional about ALF? Um, Bold Native. Bold Native, yeah, thank you. And do you What's remember that? Do you remember that bold native is called? It's on YouTube. Bold, bold native. Native. Yeah, good, it's worth watching. And do you remember that scene where um, the uh, the lady uh, is the lawyer or lobbyist or something, and she gets a welfare reform from an animal ag uh, company? I do vaguely remember that. Not the yeah. specifics, but it's been a few years. But yeah. And then she's sitting down at the dinner with her friends, who are all animal rights people, and she describes it, and everybody congratulates her. And then this one guy sort of speaks up. He's the abolitionist. He goes, uh, wait a sec here. You, you know, what did you really accomplish? You know, they're still in that system. What was the point of what you just did? She's like, oh, wow. You know, so <laughs> it's, uh, the abolitionist is not can be an unpopular voice. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe that's why welfare is popular, because these little increments are really what you're displaying, right? Like, um, and yeah. But most, most of us are abolitionists. Oh, yeah. In the sense that that's what we want. It's just a question of, like, so I, I worry sometimes, like, I know Francine is a real person, but I worry sometimes there's a straw man that's developed into a little bit of the abolitionist um, who is just absolutely unhappy with anything except abolition and everything, everything else, of, everything but that is a blight upon the movement. I know there are such people, and, and, and the reason this is a you know, relevant controversy is Francine is so much. Strike me as being pretty reasonably abolitionist in the sense that they aim for that. I think that's what he's trying to get with, with his movement is that so many of us want that final line, yeah. but we're not ready to step up and, and take it. We're happy with the gestation crates, but just like you said, there is species of, among the yeah. AR community, you yeah. know, we're happy that they're not in cages, but they're still in big farms. That's not fair. Yeah. We need to be asking all our approaches should be abolition approaches. But you know, if we do get a little bit of welfareism, then you know, let's consider it good, but not what we finally want. So we shouldn't we shouldn't step down at all. We should stay on that line and say, you know, not even say that's good for you, and just say that's not what we wanted. What so we wanted was we right. wanted the freedom. No, that makes sense. The, the, the welfare set of Francionian is unhappy with the service, putting all of their energy into these incremental. 
incremental changes. It actually applauds and yeah. thanks to people who made the changes when it's done. And yeah, I, I understand the uh, opposition suspicion. I think there's so many people that are confused yeah. about the abolition of color also because it's the use, it's excluding the use of all animals. That means no pets. You can't be breeding animals. See, that's, humans, that's what is humans, like that, that in the spectrum. I, humans you know. should have no right. Why? We are the only species that are taking other species and breeding them together for our own benefit? That doesn't make any sense. <coughs> that doesn't make any sense. Well, I, I consider myself abolitionist, but I don't think it's symbiotic with the species, which, which could be the, the ideal version. People are like breeding these animals and selling them. Well, that's true. Yeah, that's the selling is, is, you is know, in our society, symbiotic relationships between very dysfunctional forms. You see the kind of industry it takes today, but you still see glimmers of something. No, but I still consider myself an ab the abolition abolitionist toward true ex what I consider true exploitation of animals. Those cages should all be empty. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying we can't have a, you know relationships with these animals, but what I'm saying is humans are the ones that are breeding them, and if we stop breeding them, we're not going to have cats and dogs unless they're naturally unless it's the strays that are breeding, and you know they decide to live in our community. Like you know that's what happens with cavemen and you know the wolves and stuff. They came, we followed them to hunt, and they followed us. They ate off our scraps, and we became a community with the animals. That's the only way I see it in abolition. In the abolition movement, is this is no use of any animals. There, there's different sorts of abolitionisms, yeah. though. There's not just one abolitionism or one welfareism, and I yeah. think the confusion can be sometimes. But that's like, where the confusion gets in. There should yeah. be. Abolition should be the definition of no use of any animals. Why are cats and dogs different from pigs and cows? Well, you can have rescue cats and dogs. And yes, that, but they're only rescuing them because we're breeding them. Yeah, so the question is, is that an instrumental use or not? And so, uh, and I would say it is symbiotic, like I use Buddy and Buddy uses me, and we both agree uh, to use each other for fun. <laughs> I, 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 agree, I agree with that, but I'm saying is this Buddy would never have been born unless somebody bred him, right? Yes, That's all I'm saying. I'm you're saying right. No, you're right. Abolitionists need to realize that that is the final outcome. I work in a veterinary hospital, and yeah. you know, I see so many people that can't take care of their pets, or they don't care to take care of their pets. Vegans yeah. are the best pet owners out there. But there's so many animals that are suffering because that we're backyard breeders. These people come in all the time. Oh, I wanna, don't want to stay my animal because I want to breed it. That's not okay. fair. No, you're right. The animal rights activists should be fighting that. We should be fighting breeders. Oh, and I think a lot of them are. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, well, you don't even use the term pet. That's politically incorrect. It's companion animal, and yeah. we're, for, we're for the end of. Uh, a lot of us are for the end of the uh, breeding of not only of non-human uh, domestic fear. animals but ourselves too, right? But I think so, that's a big fear that yeah. comes people who don't want to be abolitionists. They don't want to take the line to be yeah. abolitionists because they're afraid of taking that line and having no animals. It's the same thing with tell people there wouldn't be cows, but what happened to stop for, but I like the cows for sanctuaries. And we wouldn't have them, we don't need them, they're not from Canada. There are no cows living out in society. Anyway. The question is not whether you're against you know, domestic breeding, but how do you go about it? Would that entail, for example, is abolitionism letting them expire, stop breeding them to let them expire, or is it, does it entail, say, killing them all? Or genocide, or you know, like you can tactics are are become an issue too. You know, yeah, you we'll never, never, we'll never be killing. It would be you know, you have to stop reading them. Right. It's us that are making the numbers, nothing yeah. else. So um, we're at nine o'clock, and we covered t two hours of this, and we didn't get through all these other topics. But I'm just going to quickly tell you what they are because I think it's interesting, and I won't get into it all. But and there are others that have come up since I did this slideshow a couple years ago. Are, are, are arguments against the treatment of, channel, treatment of animals in China racist, for and against? Depends on how you frame it, right? Can vegans be financially uh, wealthy? Uh, it's the same issue as is green capitalism uh, a good thing, right? And. Uh, uh, Know, the whole issue of ethical investments, and now since the, I did this, you know, Bill Gates has come out with Beyond Meat, so he's 
you know, this is a, the joke is that this is the one good thing that capitalism has ever done, basically, is come up with plant-based. Is it on the market? Uh, huh? Is you can buy it at Whole Foods, yeah. apparently. Yeah. It's good. Has that ever tasted? Yes, it's amazing. Yeah, really? It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can buy it in uh, Whole Foods and Oakville. Oh, okay. I, I kill, okay, keep going on. High kill versus no kill shelters, I alluded to that. Uh, PETA is famously against no kill, sh uh, no kill shelters, saying that it's uh, they suffer they must suffer from poor quality of life. Nathan Win Winograd is an author and speaker who is famously against PETA on this and for uh, the life of the animals. And those, even if their quality of life is diminished by those shelters, so big controversy. Uh, there they are. So he's against all the killing of animals on the left, she's against the all the warehousing of animals on the right in the worst those worst case scenarios. They're really involved in a toxic uh, battle. Oh yeah. yeah. A battle of, right? Yeah, they're sort of actually. Yeah, very. And cats be vegans. Um, well, there's since I did this, there's other two other cat foods that are vegan that have synthetic taurine that I know of. Uh, uh Y Song, which Paul here gives to his cat. Success. And, uh, and also Evolution, and then there's Amy, which uh, Jacinta McDonald gives to her cat. So I've heard anecdotally good things about synthetic taurine, uh, but you will run into a lot of people online who take a very, very strong position. Cats are carn obligate carnivores, and you have to give them this, therefore. The studies just haven't been long enough. That's yeah. All. So the you, studies are more than five years, people uh, Paul covered the tactics issue. Which involves, uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot one can say on that. One of the uh, famous uh, statements that is pro-violence is by Ward Churchill, not an animal rights guy by any means, but uh, pathology of pacifism versus violence. So then, um, misanthropy. We covered that in a previous lecture, but highly controversial. You know, uh, I think a lot of us are what you would call closet misanthropists, and some of us are. <laughs> open to misanthropists, <laughs> and then there's uh, others that are pro-humanist, and, um, and it will say, well, you know, you know, human rights equals animal, human right, they, human equals animal rights, and we have to sort of take a, this very uh, inclusive stance, and uh, uh, yeah, anyway, huge topic, but we can't get into that. We did cover it in the previous lecture. Who is a vegan and what is a vegan? Huge topic, right? Because how do you define veganism? We could do a whole uh, lecture on that one and we might do that in the future. What is veganism, right? Because you'll get a variety of answers, right? Uh, and people get very inflamed over that because it's their identity and everything. Uh, I, I run into people who's, who are horseback riders who say they're vegans, right? My brother says he's a vegan but he eats fish, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> say that there's only one indigenous position on, on the animal rights. There are vegan native people and there are there are histories of tribes that were primarily vegetarian. You know, so as a reference Margaret Robinson. Exactly. Or a former speaker at AR Academy, Margaret Robinson, was a Micmac uh, First Nation and, and vegan. So so and, and that's just one aspect of it. There's a lot of many others. Uh, brings up the whole issue uh, of uh, moral relativism. And then a recent topic that came up that was really, anyway, this is all, this whole slideshow is on the animalrightsacademy.org website. A recent controversial topic that came up that I thought I'll just mention, something that came up with uh, you, Lizetta, which was, okay, so you go to a, 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 a vegetarian restaurant, they serve you cheese, and uh, in of course, you're vegan, you asked for vegan, and you didn't get that. Um, they made a mistake. 
and uh, you point you wrote them a bad review online. Perfectly reasonable. But you got attacked for that. Um, also just a bad review. Huh? It, it needs to be said. Also just a bad review. It's more through it. We could have a whole evening just on that. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to describe. I'm trying to describe the the situation. Um, and so, and then what happened is that there was a um, there was a whole controversy over this, and um, the it was interesting to me I, something that I did, never thought that would be controversial became that way online. So this re, let me just segue into an, another topic. Then this raises the issue: Facebook becomes very much a, a site for animal rights controversy. <laughs> and uh, and controversy in general, you know, if you want to start an argument, just type something in Facebook, right? But um, it's um, people joke about it as well. Just from what's new, they say, "Let's get popcorn." They post pictures of popcorn now, and when they sort of focus something controversial, they say, "Oh, I'm moving." Anyway, it, it raises it raises the it raises the issue of uh, the role that Facebook has plays in the formation of the animal rights movement and in controversies, obviously a huge role. Why? That's a topic for further discussion, but it does point to the fact that psychologically, people feel much more comfortable comfortable voicing their opinions online than they do in person in a lot of these issues. And uh, uh, so we ought to, ought to have a whole topic on Facebook, because I like a whole lecture on it, because there's so much there. And on the side, though, it's... And I just want to go back to that further that topic that just that I just mentioned. It ra that for me raises the issue of um, um, our uh, an issue that Ian back there, the other Ian, has brought up a lot of times, and I kind of never paid much mind to it, but I, now I am. Which is, um, if you have a group of people that is going to a, a restaurant and they're animal rights activists, and you have a choice of a vegetarian or a vegan restaurant. Why wouldn't you choose the vegan one? And you won't actually go into a vegetarian restaurant. You will not. You actually take a matter. You you are principled in that way to a point that I haven't been. But now, because of this issue that came up, and because of your example, I made a rule for myself. Uh, I'm just going to go to vegan restaurants. Now that cuts out a lot of the choices that I have. But I think there are enough of them out there that I ought to give them priority over the ones that aren't. Absolutely. You know? And I think then in, if you have a vegan product uh, or a company that you can choose over a non-vegan one, why wouldn't you do that? And I think there's a, a, a it's the whole raises the whole issue of the power of the consumer in, in creating a better society. So I just, but this can be a controversial topic as we just found out. So, uh, Kate. Just, I think the biggest controversy in what just happened was the fact that this restaurant is so supportive of the vegan community and it's just like, well, why has this restaurant decided to go vegan, especially when the owner is vegan himself? Why? Yeah, uh, uh, he's, he's, he's not. He's not. Oh, he's not. Okay. Yeah. But I still, why have so much support for the vegan community and then not, you know, do okay. the vegan restaurant? Could it just make sense? Yeah, that's the controversy. It's like, yeah. why do they support veganism, but then not follow we through? We shouldn't, we shouldn't sell. discourage it. Like, that's because it costs a lot of money for the advertiser otherwise, right? Like, they don't have to advertise anything. They just put change on their menu. No, I mean, if they, if they promote veganism, but at the same time sell animal products, they're advertising. discuss it here, but you know, the point is is that I think it is a, I think it's a great topic that it came up. I think it's fantastic that it came up because 
it, it, it points to an issue that we all kind of need to think about, but in, in a way that is, um, you know, hopefully not like acrimonious in personal attack, but in a way we have to think about, we have to evaluate ethically the issues in it, right? And Anne Moritz Academy is, you know, provides an opportunity for that. Some people we protest at McDonald's and then all of a sudden they go to a vegetarian restaurant. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's, that doesn't we, make any sense. Yeah, yeah the irony is that, yeah, protest? here's a good point. Yeah, this is a good point. So Ian says we, we protest then, how did you put it exactly? McDonald's and all these other restaurants. And, and then go, go to a vegetarian restaurant. So it raises for me, uh, during the climate march that 350.org uh, organized and advance organized, Crowds that picture that I saw in the media of crowds of climate activists going and lining up for hot dogs, right? Yeah. So in the issue that Peter, you know, Peter says you can't be a meat vegan environmentalist, right? Yeah. Um, so it is. It is. Are are we acting in an ethically ethically consistent way at all times? In a in a society like this where there's so much uh, structural violence, it's impossible to do it all the time, right? to always act ethically, ethically consistent all the time. It is impossible, but it is something that as a vegan one ought to strive for too, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's, any other, other thoughts on this or other controversial topics I raised? Because there's quite a lot of them. Yeah. Well, I think that um, when a restaurant serves a vegan grilled cheese, that is, on, in a, that is one of the situations in which physical violence is justified. <laughs> Can you elaborate on that? Did you say that? Yeah. <laughs> I want to see you actually get action on that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to tie up the evening. Well, I wasn't supposed to show King, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. What about those vegetarian directories? Does he promote the animals like meat? Yeah, yeah, this is an interesting one. So I'm handing out, uh, doing vegan outreach with Ian on the street yeah. for the uh, last couple years ago the TVA directory, and I said, Ian, let's hand out these. He says, no, I don't want to hand them out because they're they're not fully vegan restaurants. I'm like, okay. No, but, but even some of the you grocery know? stores, they list, yeah. like, they're not even vegetarian. Like, they list the big carrot and they sell meat. I, I just thought it was interesting that you did that. Yeah. I, it made me think, you know, yeah. uh, when you did that. And I and as a result of that, I threw away those. Not even vegetarian restaurants, not all of them. 